A year ago, I was in your place, um, really starting to think of, wow, how are we going to do this? So um, it's great to say we did do it. We are doing it. Um, it's going great. And I hope we can give you some pearls on how to make um, it successful in your hospitals. So uh, as Sylvia said, I did start off, um, we, we kind of knew Compass was coming down the pipeline when it first started. They were looking at getting the grant going. Um, I work with Robin Jones uh, Mission Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina. We were at that time a primary stroke center and we started hearing about Compass and thought, wow, that it sounds great. We did have um, a, a pretty good transitional care program in place already. So we thought, hey, we could, we could do this. Um, and so we, we had, were one of the hospitals that wrote a letter of intent. So we kind of kind of had a few months to prepare and kind of think, okay, how can we do this? So we might have had a little, a little benefit from that. Um, my role at the time, I was already employed as a stroke uh, coordinator, um, navigator. We call them all different things, but I saw the patients. I did follow up phone calls already. And then um, when Compass came, we came to boot camp, and um, I started hearing about all the kind of everything that was going to have to happen was, you know, it, as you probably feel, you get a little overwhelmed at times and think, wow, is this, you know, how, how much can we, can we really do? And it's, but it sounds very exciting and is definitely something we wanted to do. Um, so we looked at, kind of dove in. Um, some of the pearls I think that you guys can learn from um, is definitely we looked at, we already, Mission Hospital, start to give you a little background. Mission Hospital is an 800 bed, um, <coughs> hospital. It's a six hospital system. Uh, Mission Hospital is the center of five other hospitals um, around. We are now comprehensive stroke center as of this year. Yay. <laughs> so and, and Compass was definitely a part of that. We utilized the transition care process of Compass um, in our presentation of becoming a comprehensive stroke program. So it, it went wonderfully. Um, but we looked at um, how, how could we how could we make this flow even better? And we have a neurology uh, office that was um, a part of us. So we already kind of had that um, stroke stroke follow up, but not for enough patients. And that's where we really wanted to see how can we get more patients seeing that specialist, that that neurology specialist. How can we get more patients getting rehab um, after discharge? How can we get them? with more follow-up phone calls, more touch base, looking at our readmission. So um, we started meeting with our neurology outpatient office trying to figure out, okay, who could be our APP? And we actually utilized, um, our, our office is extremely busy. They said, you could have this space. We've got this room for one afternoon. On Thursday afternoon, you can utilize this space, but we don't have any um, NPs that can help, and we don't have any MAs that can help, and you're kind of on your own. So bring your own computer and go for it. Um, so we said, thank you, <laughs> and then we just kind of went with it. Um, so we started off with one of our inpatient, myself and an inpatient neurologist. So we both had to learn the outpatient um, EMR. That was a struggle for a little bit. It's similar, but, but different. Um, we had to learn the process of ordering things in the outpatient world instead of the inpatient world. Um, so there was a benefit that my NP actually saw a lot of our patients and then saw them in the outpatient world, but um, it took us a long time to kind of get over some of those hurdles. Um, in the meantime, in a year, we've actually transitioned now, I think, because our the practice and our administrators saw how wonderful this program was and how much we were helping our patients. They actually said, wow, I think we're, we are actually, they, well, they get to the point where they were hiring more nurse practitioners at the outpatient office, neurology office, and they said, we can give you one of our NPs for um, half a day now. And so we've grown it. We actually have an NP now um, for uh, six hours on Fridays, and when we need it, we have another three hours on Thursdays. So we went from a three-hour clinic to a nine-hour clinic um, because our administrators saw the benefit of this. So that, that's how we've grown over the year. Um, we also then uh, were able to get our administrators to say, wow, my, my role was really helping to become a comprehensive stroke center at that time and looking into all that, the data and everything and the quality measures that go into that. And so that's when we were able to say, wow, we, it would be great if we had an FT E that could be focused 100% on um, Compass, and they agreed. And hence, I 
Debbie was a case, we actually we case managed together on our stroke unit, on our neurology stroke unit, and I recruited Debbie and said, please come work as a compass coordinator. Um, and so that's when she came on, so we spent a couple months training Debbie, and I went back to doing comprehensive stuff, and she is now our full-time compass coordinator. Um, and I know I'm speaking to people that would say, oh my gosh, that would be so awesome if I could be a full-time one, just do one job probably, I know there's some of you that do wear many hats. Um, so we are blessed to have an administrative buy-in that says, yes, we can have a full-time compass RN to just look at, and she does, um, she'll go into more of how we do it, but she definitely does a lot of the navigation. And I think um, uh, seeing patients while they're in the hospital, doing that navigation, looking at quality measures, and then um, seeing them um, and, and making sure they follow up with a compass clinic and, and see those patients. So I think that's been a huge buy-in. Um, and we'll kind of, I'm going to pass it to Debbie. I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but, and then we'll kind of go over some of the, definitely we want to leave lots of time for questions. And you guys can ask us how, how did we implement this? How did we do it? And we're open to answer anything and everything we possibly can for you guys. So um, I'm Debbie Stamey, and uh, I am in charge of the Compass, well, oversee the Compass um, program now. Uh, I was extremely fortunate in that I was placed in this position after Melissa and Robin had <laughs> the program developed. So I, I, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the problems they had worked out. Um, so I am a full-time, I work with Compass full-time. Um, and the way I get my patient list is we have worked with IT and when we have orders that are put in under the stroke uh, power, plan. power plan, I have generated, it generates a list of stroke patients and mine can go anywhere 25 to 30 patients a day. And we have them all over the hospital and we actually have a campus across the street as well. I don't usually see those. Um, and we also have a program that generates our stroke patients when they're being discharged. So as soon as they get a discharge, I get an e uh, email that tells me they're going. So if I haven't already seen them that day, I make sure that I do review the chart and I'm able to go meet with them if they are um, a candidate for the Compass program. What I have found is um, the more patients that I'm able to see prior to them leaving, if you can kind of meet with them and hand up the, the folder in person, the more likely they are to return because they want to see a face. Um, and it's just that personal contact and when you're able to sit down, and they did a great demonstration earlier, and, and how can you say no? Um, and so it, it is real important to get in there and see them. We do have quite a few folks in our hospital, so sometimes I don't get to see them, but I make sure that on the uh, call back that um, I do check in with them. Um, so I'm trying to, where should I? And I think some of the things when you're starting up um, the clinic, um, some of the things we were at our little focus group upstairs and we're just trying to think of what, what are some things that can make it um, easier for you guys to do when, when you're starting and when we started. And, and definitely, when you go to schedule your first um, patients, do not schedule a full clinic list. Um, we started off with two patients. You know, we, we, gave, we made sure we had um, like a two hour block to see one patient, <laughs> just to get through to make sure, because there's a, there's a lot of questions, and I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know what all you've gone through yet, and if you've looked at all the questions that you've got to screen and ask these patients. But when you're first starting, I did start, um, I spent time just going through those questions, going through some, some pretend patients and going, asking those questions out loud, making sure I really understood the nuances of what we were trying to get with those questions. So I just started, you know, play rolling with those questions. And then um, it still took me an hour, at least an hour, to get through those questions the very first time. So. Give yourself some time. Don't schedule a full, you know, a full load. So we kind of went from two patients to four patients to six patients, you know, and, until we kind of got got it down. And I think when we see patients in the clinic, to definitely make sure um, be flexible. So I think they've got. I know they've kind of gone over the key points of 
you're going to, um, for us, uh, like I said, our clinic said, uh, we're overbooked, we're overworked, uh, my, our MAs cannot, um, what we call, intake your patients. So I know some places have an MA come in and they get the vital sign and they do the med rec and, and they do the first little screening questions. Our clinic couldn't afford to, to let somebody do that, so we do that, um, which is it's fine, it's okay. So I think just looking at your setup and how, looking at every way possible that you can make this work. Um, so we go and get the patient and bring them in and do the full intake and med rec and everything. And then we open up our compass um, and go through all those questions with them and then the caregiver questions if it's indicated. And then we also do um, the little role that's it's, it's labeled, I can't remember it's labeled, but it's, it's more, it's asked the questions um, that sometimes the APP would be asking. So some offices um, and hospital systems, the APP goes over those questions. Some systems, we go over those questions. We've just kind of generalized said that we know if somebody smokes, we've told our RAPP, we're gonna say yes, you've talked to them about smoking, so you have to talk to them about smoking, okay? <laughs> and they do, they're really good at it. So we go ahead and, and in our clinic, we answer all of the questions. And then we um, meet with the NP real quick without the patient. We go over the main things of while they're still not walking well. They um, didn't have speech therapy ordered and they're still having cognitive issues. Cognitive issues are something we, we see chronically, that patients don't get speech, speech and OT ordered. Um, like PT is, is ordered pretty, if you can't walk, you know, that, that's pretty noticeable and that gets ordered. But patients a lot of times don't even know they have cognitive issues until they get home. And they try to run their life again and they can't. They can't remember numbers, they can't send texts, they get bundled up, they can't manage their account, their bank account. And they get, they get to us and they say, it's just not right and I just can't, I can't figure this out. Um, so then we make sure we get speech involved for, and we tell them it's not because you can't talk, it's, it's, they, you know, it's for your cognition, for your memory. Um, so we let the nurse practitioner or APP know um, what are some of the things we feel are still necessary. Their blood pressure was too high, their blood pressure was too low, what do you think that might be happening? And then um, we bring the patient over to them then the APP does her full eval, and then we actually go back and print off our um, e-care plan and go over and make sure it has all the community resources that they might need listed on that e-care plan, and then we go back and hand it to our um, APP to review. So we've heard upstairs that other systems, actually the um, PAC and the APP sit in the room together, and they do it together, and as the um, doctor is going over the questions, She's answering, she's clicking through and answering some of the mobility questions while the doctor's doing her exam. So, as, as Sylvia, I'm sure you've said this multiple times, it's pragmatic. <laughs> Which means, you, yes, you have certain things that need to be done, and we want it done in a way, it is a study, so there's certain key elements that have to be done, but you can do it um, in the way that works for you. So, so be open to it and, and just think of, okay, how can, we get the key elements done in a way that is going to be the best for our patients, our clinic, for our, our providers um, to be able to continue through their clinic day. Um, those are some of the main, main key points, is just kind of go with the flow and figure out how it works for you. Um, Melissa, can I ask a question? How, Absolutely. how average, because we're telling them like 13 or 14 minutes now, depending on the severity, on average, how long is it taking you to do the the intake, Debbie, and but also how was your average visit with a patient? Right well, we allot an hour per patient, um, and my uh, nurse practitioner would really like to have 45 minutes of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but when you guys start start going over the questions, you'll you'll realize that that 15 minutes is not realistic. Um, it may take you 30 minutes or 45 minutes the first time you do it. Um, but now, but now, um, I've been at this role for several months now, and um, I have my own system, and you, you have to redirect. And what I usually tell the patient, I, I just, we sit down, and I said, let me tell you a little bit about this appointment. 
Um, well, you're going to be in here with me for about 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions. Um, we just want to screen, um, make sure you're getting all the therapy you need. Uh, we're going to do a depression screening, and then we're going to go next door, and there's a nurse practitioner, and she is going to go over the medical end of it. So when they start pulling out all of these med lists, and well, you do have to do the med list when you're when you go through the questions, but they're going to start pulling out all of all kinds of things. Um, and if you can, at that point, just say, if, if you don't mind, just hold on to those. Uh, the nurse practitioner next door is going to go over all of that with you. Um, and that's, it, it, it takes a while. I mean, it, it may take you a couple months to get used to, um, you know, limiting the time with the questions. Right now, I'm down to about 15 minutes, but it's taken me quite a while um, because these people are so vulnerable and, and a lot of times they haven't seen their primary care doctor yet. You're the first connection since they've been home with this stroke and they have so much they want to share. Um, so, of course, we're all human. We want to hear some of those stories, but if you can't, just kind of redirect. Um, yeah. and, and I think absolutely learning how to redirect the patient and getting them um, it, you know, focus that this is going to be kind of rapid fire questioning and then you're going to have more time with the nurse practitioner. But for the most part, about 15 minutes. So, but, um, and I said I heard other sites are still doing a, a 20 to 40 minute visit and trying to do it all. God bless her. Uh, so, um, and I think looking at that, I, I was just thinking as you, as you brought up time, um, looking at your billing, and I know we've talked. To, uh, they probably have talked to you about how you can get the transitional um, billing codes, and we actually personally have found in our community that our primary care doctors are already utilizing those codes, and we did not want to set up any battlefield. We wanted them to be very um, friendly with us, and we wanted to work as a team. So we are billing. Um, I said we see as long as our NP can get a good 45 minutes, we're doing the. Um, uh, oh shoot. Yeah. Extended care, thank you. <laughs> Extended care billing is like, just let me. So you can definitely look at different options to bill, which still gets you um, a higher income, a higher rate than just your traditional 20 or 40 minute billing. So um, looking at that can definitely, maybe looking at that billing, talking to your bills, say, hey, if, 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 if your doctor can get more money by keep getting a 60 minute visit, maybe you guys can have a little more time and not kill yourselves trying to get patients through in 20 minutes. Um, and, and make more money as you can. So I think that's a huge benefit. Um, a piece I, I probably should have started with is looking at um, your community network. Um, I did start, Debbie was, wasn't in this role yet, so when Compass rolled out, it was, okay, I gotta get my community, community network together. Um, I looked at, um, I was a case manager prior to being a stroke coordinator, so I had a lot of those resources, so it was a benefit. So definitely utilize your case managers, utilize your, um, a lot of counties have community paramedics. They are a wealth of knowledge, so get to know them very well. And then uh, look at your Council on Aging, any, any other group, case management, anybody who already has a list of these resources, pull them in and say, there's no need to go digging up these resources when they already have them. So thankfully our case managers and different groups already had a lot of these resources, so pulling them together wasn't too hard. One thing I <laughs> did not realize as much, um, somehow, I don't know, missed it, was the huge part that rehab has um, in this. And so I knew my role was gonna be make sure rehab is ordered and the, the patients were getting the rehab that they needed, but I didn't quite plan and realize until we were already up and running, oh my gosh, I need to have this huge you know, connection with my rehab, with my home health rehab um, facilities. And at first it was like, Oh my gosh, we serve 18 counties. How do I how do I communicate with all of my rehab um, groups? That's just was daunting to me. I didn't know how I could possibly do that. So I said, Well, you know what I'm gonna do? <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna look at my rehab um, that I utilize most. And for us, that is care partners. So we have care partners inpatient rehab hospital. Care partners has outpatient. They have home health. So I looked at that's that's the so my um, advice to you is to look at the groups one or two three that you utilize the most. You may not be able to get to all 
20 agencies that you might use. I don't know how many um, agencies we could possibly use if I try to find all of them. But let's look at the one that I use the most and let's make a huge you know, um, connection with them and really get them. And we were blessed with getting um, Jane and her group to really, they really bought into this. And I guess so trying to find that champion, that, that leader in your rehab world that is going to buy into it and then looking at the connections um, of how do we communicate? How do we, because sometimes we just, our communication in the hospital world is I send a fax, I send an order, that's communication, right? Um, how do we take it to the next level? How do we make sure that they really understand that this patient is a compass patient? What does that entail? What does that mean? What is movement matters? And how can we work from there? So I will pass on to Jane now and she can tell you all about how the rehab part of this works. I think I'm live. Can you hear me? <laughs> I don't want to be shouting. Am I too loud? Or is this all right? Okay, good. All right. Well, I had to resist. Maybe, Jane, if you could What's use a mic because we're videotaping. I don't. Get one on. She's, yeah. Oh, you got one on. I do have one on. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't resist bringing you a picture of fall in the mountains. The, the intensity is better on the smaller screens, but this is not how it's looking right now. I think in a few more weeks, we, we hopefully we'll see this. This is a common topic of conversation in Western North Carolina. What is the color going to be this year? So we'll worry a little bit about it. But anyways, this is where we come from. And it does represent our journey. And I'm kind of the outlier here today because I am, as I said, I'm Jane Anderson. I'm a physical therapist. I am currently working full time in therapy education. So kind of the outlier, the other side of the fence, and presenting what's happening in the post-acute services side. Let me see if I can figure this one out. Let's do this. Yes, it worked. Okay, so I'm here to talk about and share what we did as a post-acute provider, what we wished we had done. Um, and I, I certainly want to say that our way of doing things is not the only way. You will figure out what works best for your organization and how to make it work for you, and possibly they will have some tips for you that will help. So it's always beneficial to see what the other side is doing and to learn from that. <laughs> Our, I am home health, and I, and I have a, a partner. We are absolutely champions, and I have to say that it's champions not because we're great, but champions because we really buy into Compass, and we really are um, enthusiastic about promoting Compass. So my partner, Noray, is not here. I'll kind of turn and look down, I'm looking for her. So sometimes I'll slip into we, but I'm gonna stay with the I. But our introduction to Compass, well, it was at that site-specific intervention implementation workshop. I got it all out there. September 2016, so it's been a year. And who went to it was my colleague, Noray, who's a nurse in home health and an educator, and I was a physical therapy representative. And then we did have a rehab supervisor, but we did not have anyone from outpatient ther therapy, and I will mention that again. And so that's the who, what, and the when, but the wow factor for us was our reaction to that training. We left so excited and motivated, and we were really proud to be a part of this. It was like, oh yes, mission is an intervention arm. I'm so glad we're not just doing regular stuff. You know? <laughs> we really bought into it. I have to say it was so motivational. We got back and, and really were ready to go. Now the challenge when we got back is that to learn that we had two weeks before it was going to start. But anyways, <laughs> but here's our takeaway from that experience. And thinking of ideal, you know, ideal is what we all strive for and reality sometimes takes over. But ideally, what you would want at that site training is if your home health representatives, and we just couldn't imagine making it work without a nurse and a therapy representative our input was essential to each other to make that work. And also that therapy team leader from outpatient, which we did not have at that time, but got on board quickly. If it's all possible, and I remember I'm talking ideally, having somebody with an interest or experience in neuro really makes a big difference. I didn't really even know what I was going to when I went to this meeting. Okay, it came, up, came to me kind of quickly, but I do have a strong neuro background. It was my start with physical therapy, I love neuro. I don't see a lot of neuro patients in home health compared to other diagnoses, but I really got excited to learn this is going to be a study about stroke patients and post-acute services. If you can somehow find leaders who will make a commitment, I think it makes all the difference. If there isn't that commitment, I don't think that, it's kind of something that you, you 
that has to be sort of instilled in other people, you pass it on. And I felt it really made a difference if the post-acute services to have people that had that commitment. So we were then, we moved into our preparation phase. And this is why I mentioned our countdown was two weeks. So we had three objectives that we felt we could accomplish in that two week period of time. And if it's ever possible to change how much time you have for the preparation phase, that would be helpful, but again, reality sets in. So we thought we could do three things. The first thing was to get our leaders in place. So we had home health in place, me and Lorraine, and then we had to get our outpatient group in. And I could see the difference from them not being able, not attending that site uh, training, because we tried really hard to generate that excitement and motivation and all that, so it took a little bit more work to do that. So if it's possible to get those leaders in the first time, that's usually great. We wanted to introduce Compass to everybody. And also we felt like we couldn't get it started really, but we wanted to identify what would be any staff training needs. We felt very motivated to make sure that we were doing best practice, that we were doing everything that met the principles of the Compass program. So, as far as introducing Compass to everyone, we have to, it's kind of a context here, is our home health agency has an average daily census, I even texted my boss this morning to make sure I had this right, 1,200 patients a day. Oh. So we're big, wow. we do cover a lot of areas. So with that many patients, patient staff are seeing so many patients, busy, busy staff, we had to figure out a way that we were gonna keep staff knowing about Compass, staying on track with Compass, and when they do get a Compass patient, and our, we were only getting them about one to two a week, we have over 100 nurses, over 75 therapists. How are we gonna keep all these folks knowing what they were gonna be doing? So first was to give them that introduction. So we did all the visiting staff and outpatient was doing the, the in-service training for their staff. And then we got the clinical managers in the office on board. And it was really important to get our office staff understanding Compass because they were the ones that were taking in those referrals. So they needed to kind of get a sense of what it was. And then we needed to share that with administrators and medical staff and anyone that we could grab in the hallway was learning about Compass. We kind of felt like we were doing the marketing. So Noray had a storyboard, which I meant to bring today, didn't bring it, but we would put flyers up too about Compass just to keep it in people's vision. So that was introducing Compass to everyone. Our next objective in this preparation phase was identifying staff training needs. Well, it was using this tool the four directions of the compass led us directly to deciding what is it we needed to do, what were our strengths, and since I don't like the word weakness, I say what were our opportunities. So we were looking and going, okay, over here are the willingness to improve my health or strength. We felt that our medication reconciliation was the strength. That's something that's really emphasized in home health. Our nurses are very good at med reconciliation. We have an interesting program for therapy that's a therapy only patient where we collaborate with pharmacists. And that's been a really great program because they take it to a whole other level, way beyond our scope of practice. So we thought, okay, we're pretty good there. That's our strength. Hmm, lifestyle changes, talking with the nurses. Nurses weren't so confident about how do you coach lifestyle changes. So we thought, okay, that should go on our list as an opportunity. We looked over here at now my numbers, blood pressure. Did all of our therapists take accurate blood pressures? You know, we have speech therapists that aren't as comfortable taking vital signs, but they are required. So we thought, okay, we have an opportunity there. We we're looking at this part over here, check my mood. It really fit, resonated with our agency, that the, uh, the emphasis of mood matters, because we have been experiencing things in home health and seeing changes in incidents of depression, suicidal ideation, things like that small changes, but in that direction that we wanted. So it fit, so at this time, what we ended up doing was, um, all home health agencies use the PHQ-2 for screening for signs and symptoms of depression, and all patients are screened at time points. But then we instituted a process, um, policy procedure, where we, if we have a patient scoring positively on the PHQ-2, then we would implement the PHQ-9. And there would be a process if anyone scored high on the PHQ-9, or if anyone scored positive on item nine of that, which is about suicidal ideation. So it really fit, the timing was just right. We saw that as an opportunity to really make sure that our process was in effect. So we use this, this was a great tool because it tells you, you know, where are you, what's your staff needs. 
So here are the trainings. Um, it, these are trainings that have happened over this past year. And what we found is these trainings that we did, they were benefiting all of our patients. So we completed these in both the preparation and our implementation phase. With therapists, we you know, went ahead and did competencies in taking accurate blood pressures. And what we realized when we did that, that they were using very inadequate stethoscopes. So we were able to get new equipment. Um, we were using blood pressure cups that were too small for some of our patients, so they, they were getting different size blood pressure cups. So that was a good thing. We had a pharmacist come in and he took the antihypertensive medications that are on the compass formulary and talked to the therapists about that, particularly how it affects exercises and side effects they needed to be looking for. And we did movement matters in detail with the therapists and instituted a toggle program with our PTAs. All of the staff, we did a review of our vital sign parameters, we did our um, update and upgrade of our depression screening, and we had a lot of in services on patient coaching for self management of chronic conditions, because that's such an important part of the Compass program is that self management. I know from my own experience as a physical therapist, I can make a patient work hard, I can get in there and motivate them, even the grumpy ones, we can get them going, and then I can leave, and then maybe they aren't doing anything. So I come back. So that mindset has to change among those of us who are, are encouraging patients to achieve a level of self advocacy so they can take care of themselves. So I think in all levels of healthcare, finding ways to, to tools and things to get our patients to self-manage is so important. And then for our nurses, we had a great dietitian from the hospital talk to them about coaching Mediterranean and DASH diets. And that was very helpful. I want to put a little idea in the PACS minds here about education. Nothing gets our clinical staff, our visiting staff, more excited than clinical education that's very relevant to their patients. They want to be providing the best possible care. So, you know, we can have a, a meeting or an in-service on something regulatory and, you know, there's very few people in the room, but you put out a clinical topic and it fills the room. So if you have the contacts or resources at the hospital that could help um, the post-acute providers, that would be a great thing. We've used pharmacists from the hospital and the, the great dietitian that, that spoke to us recently about coaching diet came from the hospital. So you, you have an opportunity to share with them. Okay. A little bit in hindsight, from a home health perspective, what we wish we had done in the preparation phase, this didn't occur to us in the preparation phase that it would be important. And um, Melissa spoke a little bit about that. Setting up a plan with our PACs to identify compass referrals right from the start of the study. You know, that didn't even cross our minds when we first started. Somehow we thought we were, they were just going to be there and know and we'd be ready to go. And, and then it wasn't quite that easy. Again, I think about the numbers. Not that many patients are going to be compass patients. You know, with the numbers that especially we see, and if you're a smaller hospital, it would probably be the same way. And when we would have those compass calls, if you're post, on the post-acute side, you have at first bi-weekly and then monthly calls. I was hearing the same thing from other post-acute providers, that they weren't sure if they were compass patients. I remember that first week, Noreen and I were looking at each other and going into the team rooms. The schedulers were, do we have compass patients? And they go, I don't know. We weren't sure. So it took a little work figuring out because our referrals were coming in through office staff who weren't able to screen through patient charts to find that they were compass patients. So then, when Debbie and Melissa started really clearly marking it as a compass patient in the deep heart summary, then we, then we were on board. Then kind of knew where to go with it. And we got the office staff so that if, if we have a couple weeks go by and we haven't had many compass patients, they'll come to us and say, what's the deal? Why don't we have enough more compass patients? You know, they're looking for them now. But I wish we'd set that up from the very beginning. That's something that could be done in the preparation phase. Okay, so we're out of preparation, we're into implementation. Here's what we found. It required pretty close monitoring by the compass leaders to get things started. We started out communicating with every visiting staff that had a compass patient. And we would flag our charts with little reminders, things like, this is a compass patient. We put a patient notification so it, as soon as they open their computer and open up that patient's chart, there it would be. It would say things like, they, their um, outpatient neuro appointment is such and such. Um, check, your, 
check your or read your checklist for guidelines or whatever. We put these little prompts in there. Now there aren't that many patients, so we were able to do it at this point. So it really took that, that close monitoring. They'd all had that training, but they still needed help and figure out how were they supposed to get started with this. And like I said, these are very busy people and they don't see very many compass patients. Where am I going here? Okay. Then keeping that compass awareness among our very large and busy staff. So every staff meeting that we had always had a little section that was about compass updates, just to keep that foremost in their mind. We included compass in our orientation checklist for new staff. We want to make sure that they came on board and they knew about it right from the start. And I, I bet that um, most of your post-acute providers have care conferences for their patients. So that's another great place to make them put on their little to-do list for their care conferences any compass patients. Let's have a discussion, a compass discussion. They can do that if nobody has any, that's fine. If they do, then they can take a little time to talk about you know, any compass issues, how we, are we able to provide what we need to be providing. So that was good. And then what I found is it required creating a compass checklist. I'm going to pass out a checklist. Debbie, so would you pass this out? And I'm not endorsing this at all. This is something I created. And you know, afterwards you can recycle it back to me and that's just fine. But I, I kind of have a point in showing it to you. Because we would be months into Compass and somebody would call me up and say, I have a Compass patient. This is my first Compass patient. What am I supposed to do? And I'd say, well, you remember the in-service handouts that you got back then? And they said, well, yeah, but tell, tell me what I'm supposed to do. They want it, they are staff. The benefit of this kind of a tool for our staff, and this may work for other places, maybe not helpful, but it is it puts something on one page, because they like to save one page things to their desktop or their computers. It was a checklist format, and it was simple and kind of straightforward, and they like stuff like that. These are our staff, and we kind of know them by then. So this is all compass information, but it's just a little bit different format. But I also felt like it gave them kind of a visual. It gets so visual if you just glance at the whole thing. There's L's for who's the lead, who's the support participant, with all these different things. What it does is say, wow, we have a lot to address with this patient. I mean, it gives you a sense of, of all these things. In addition to other things that they're doing, they've got all these things. The other part of it is, wow, we're kind of all in this together that it really does work when it's a team approach and what we reinforce. So if you're not the L, you still have a check. Very often, you're still going to have a check next to it, and you really want to be supporting what other people are doing. For example, under Know Your Numbers, like teaching patients how to use their blood pressure home monitor. Well, everybody's doing that. Everybody that goes in the home is doing that to make sure that they become competent with that. And encouraging the patients to keep that log. You know, it takes a lot of you know, encouragement to get people to keep logs and things. And we were encouraging the logs with the blood pressure readings, but also we were encouraging exercise and activity logs. So encouraging that over and over starts to become a habit after a while, and habits are good, that's a good habit. Another one that we um, just kind of emphasized was under engage your mind and body, the physical activity counseling, your PT and OT are your leaders, but speech and nursing has a role with that. Nurses are encouraging the activity, talking to them, have they gotten up the move. We've encouraged our speech therapists who usually work with patients in the city, and they sit for about 45 minutes, and somewhere in the middle of that, do a stand and stretch. Get patients up, getting them moving. They don't have to do all the exercises, but they just have to get them up and, and make sure that they are, are actually moving a little bit and not being so sedentary. We were very compelled by that information. About 75% of a stroke survivor's day is spent either sitting or lying down. That's, that's a lot of time not moving. So this was just a tool. You can come up with any kind of tool you want, but knowing our staff, they liked little checklists. I wanted them to really kind of get the sense that we're a team. Down at the bottom, it reminds people about encouraging that neuro appointment and also encouraging, or also reviewing the e-care plan with them. Okay, coordination with our wonderful paths. There are many options for how, you, how a post-acute provider can set up their relationship with their paths. And we are both big places, and maybe you'll have the advantage of having post-acute providers that are in small places in close proximity. It certainly is an advantage to that. 
but what we found is that we do most of our communications are between the PACs and the home health team leaders, and if there's anything our staff to know, we will disseminate that. Although Debbie reminded me last night that you know she got a call from one of the therapists saying the patient doesn't want to go to, to their outpatient neuro appointment. And then she was able to call the patient and convince the patient that it was a worthwhile endeavor and the patient went to the appointment. So that was an opportunity for them. But in general, our coordination has been with Debbie and Melissa and Noray and me. Medical issues, our visiting staff, um, because this is the way they always do it, and they do it very effectively and efficiently, we report directly to our primary physicians for things like uh, blood pressure parameters or something like that. And we found that with the e-care plans, there's different ways of looking at an e-care plan. What seemed to work best for our staff and made it simplest for them was to always view the e-care plan in the patient home with the patient. There are a few other lessons that we have learned. Um, what we learned, and this is more appropriate for the uh, staff to know, is the initial referral may not include all the appropriate disciplines for an interdisciplinary team approach. Sometimes it'll just be physical therapy, which is what everybody seems to know about. And, but fortunately, you know, the staff know that they need to be assessing for other disciplines so that we really do have a team approach. The first compass patient I saw, one of our very first ones, I went with a new speech therapist. And he had just been ordered physical therapy. He was in his late 40s, very motivated gentleman. And then the physical therapist felt that he was having some swallowing problems. Um, and so I, uh, speech had been ordered. So I went out with her because it was one of her first visits with our agency. And I was real eager to see my first compass patient. And in the course of things, that he had actually had very quick resolution of some of his speech problems. But in her assessment at that time, it was really evident that he was having high-level cognitive problems. So she was able to keep him, like as um, Melissa mentioned, that sometimes gets overlooked. So it was so clear that he really did need and benefit from speech. But also while I was there, he was a very motivated gentleman. His wife was a CNA, and they were being really on top of blood pressure. His blood pressure was actually quite stable. And he started to, as we were getting into things, he said to me, you know what? This is all really great, he said, but I don't really understand what Compass is. And I was kind of taken aback, because he gave an impression of really understanding everything, and he'd already been to his outpatient neuro appointment. So this is an example of these first two bullets. This gentleman needed a nurse. He didn't know about his diet. He wasn't always managing his, his um, diabetes. So it was real clear that although he kind of presented like he had everything under control, it didn't take too much time with them to see where things were falling apart for him. So that's an example of needing other disciplines. So nursing came out, and that worked out very well. And also that patient and caregivers are often overwhelmed with information when they return home. And I know they've gotten wonderful education about the Compass program. And then they get home, and things tend to unravel a little bit. So you have to be, we you know, told staff over and over, be prepared to go right back to the beginning and help them make sense of what it is. <coughs> For example, the next one. Patients sometimes are reluctant to go to their outpatient neuro appointments. That means they really haven't understood the benefit of doing that. So I've, I've had staff call and say, you know what, they don't want to go to their outpatient neuro appointment. And I said, well, you've got to, to make sure they understand the benefit. And then that, that usually works. Or call Debbie. <laughs> She'll get <them> there. <laughs> okay. And the last thing that is um, so clear from this experience is this team approach with repetition of the same message. That really makes such a difference. So as of November, we will move into our sustainability phase. Um, but I want to say that our journey is continuing. There's still so much. It's, we have so many more opportunities to continue to improve the delivery of care to our stroke patients. We've been very grateful to be part of this study, because not only do we feel like we have an ongoing new skill set of, of improving this delivery of care, but it also applies this model can lend itself to other diagnoses and conditions and, and uh, has shown us a, a different way maybe to approach those as well. So we've been very grateful to be part of the Compass. Questions, please. <laughs> So I just want to make a comment. I'm, I'm about ready to cry. <laughs> I think you I thought fine. you would be. <laughs> you know, this is really a hard journey, and 
what Jane is representing, I wish was scaled across all sites, but that was our vision that we really had to build these partnerships, especially with home health and these, uh, with these patients, because just as she said, you get this perspective and you really see the real world. But the effort that they went to to make this work is just a, a lot. Uh, but it is, unfortunately, it is what it's going to take to revolutionize care in the home health industry. So Jane, I mean, you, this is just phenomenal. And the championship that it makes and how home health should be delivered. Um, because I mentioned yesterday that a lot of the challenges in home health now is that overwhelmingly it's not a nice word in Washington because there's so much diversity and they're cutting back services. And they put new conditions of participation that you guys have to comply with in January, all these regulatory issues. Do you see that this type of model will help you with these new conditions and participations? What if you? What has been the benefit to you as a home health agency? Well, the obvious benefit has been to it really reinforced and showed <coughs> outcome. Now, I don't actually know study outcomes for our agency, but as far as patient outcomes, it's brought. We, we all know that teamwork is essential in home health. I mean, you go out one at a time, you don't see each other, sometimes you pass on the road or whatever. But if you don't work as a team, so what I've seen is closer communication and collaboration. And, you know, that you all have to support each other. When we know that that was important, this kind of reinforced that. So the benefits as far as patient care, it's just, we could use this model with heart failure patients. We could use this model with I mean, other kind of patients, I mean, it's obviously slightly different things, but it, this whole concept, all those things, it so fits. As far as how we're, we have to really prove our value at home health now. That is, it has therapists actually quite concerned because there's a trend right now with bundle payments and all that, and I'm speaking in an area that I don't know enough about, but um, outcomes are essential and we have to prove our work now. Very often, it's like your worth is proved through documentation. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. But it's patient outcomes where the real value of your work shows. So I, I just feel like you know, being a part of a program like this and being able to take it also to other patients, and I think it's just made us a stronger home health agency. Thank you very much. Music, Curry. Absolutely. It's all the work that, I mean, really, the work that your team did be able to, to implement it. Yeah. And then real quick, Senator, everybody's probably hungry and waiting for lunch. <laughs> Are there any other questions first? What system do you have at Mission? Are you Epic? No, we are CERN. CERN. Um, they are not CERN, though. Actually, we are. And so it's a different version. It's a different version. Yes. So, talk so we don't. I can't see what they see, and they can't see what talk I see. To her um, that's down the pipeline. Eventually, we'll be able to see. But I think one um, benefit of saying, you know, what is the benefit of this too is um, before, like I said, we would just kind of send referrals and we kind of assumed it happened. And, you know, if we didn't hear back from our patients, a lot of times we had no idea what was really happening after the hospital. Um, we might call them at a week. Usually that was kind of a, a seven to ten day callback. It was kind of, kind of the standard for a long time. Um, when we started Compass, one of the first things we learned is we started sending our patients out. And the ones that were um, lucky enough to get a speech therapy order, we would see them back at two weeks, you know, a one week to two week visit, and speech therapy had not started. And, um, and we were saying, oh wow, why, why isn't this getting started? We just noticed this trend. But without getting our patients back in, in that early, you know, and actually being the same patient, the same, you know, group that was seeing them in the hospital, now seeing them outside, we were actually seeing, well, why isn't speech therapy being ordered? So we started calling. And we realized that our, our poor therapists were, um, they had this huge, um, you know, they, they didn't have enough speech therapists. And so they were actually scheduling around six weeks out. And so we said, well, that's, that's just not gonna do. <laughs> that's not safe, that's not okay. And so we pulled our, our team together and we said, well, what can our inpatient hospital speech therapists do? And what can we do as nurses? And what can, you know, what, what can we, how can we bridge this gap? <coughs> yes, they were telling us they were recruiting speech therapists and they were trying to get speech therapists ordered. But 
Um, especially in some of the more rural counties, we see we have 18 counties actually that we get patients from and have to send them back home. They they might have one speech therapist that was trying to you know see the entire their entire county, um, and it was they were just really having a difficult time. So we really looked at how can our speech therapists and nurses give them more education um, and prepare them better to go home, so that they were already working on exercises and um, a proper swallowing technique. And if they were going home on um, a thick and liquid, you know, that was something Debbie and I could make sure we were following up on. Because so many of the patients would call and say, oh no, we just went ahead and started drinking regular liquid again. And we're going, oh, oh. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so it was really something we knew we had to contact them earlier and more frequent to make sure that they weren't going ahead and starting drinking regular liquid when they needed to be on uh, thick and liquids. Um, and, and so I think we made a, a huge impact on those patients. And it's just how we, we pulled the inpatient and the outpatient world together when normally without Compass, we would have had no idea of what was going on um, uh, you know, in these two worlds, even though we're part of the same system, we're seeing the same patients. You know, we were we're all worried about readmissions, <laughs> yet we, we didn't know what was going on and what problems that we could have been helping each other with. So that's just one example of how it worked. And it allowed me to actually take the word compass to a meeting with an administrator and say, I've got compass patients who are waiting for their speech. <laughs> Why are we doing more recruiting, more aggressive? And, and unfortunately right now it, it, it's changed and home health doesn't have a waiting list anymore for it. Yes. I don't think a no. patient may not either. I found those much needed speech therapists. So. Now we need them in the inpatient. <laughs> <laughs> no, they should Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just to remind me, um, Sarah actually got a press gainy report, you know, all the patient satisfaction surveys, and it said that the Compass team makes the impossible happen. Aww. And I thought that was so cool, and I was waiting for a perfect time to share it, and I thought this is exactly what you guys just made me feel like yeah. you made the impossible happen. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and our, our press meeting, too, our, our, same, our quality indicators of that. Um, definitely improved once we just met. We, we, just, we weren't even really looking for it. We were just looking, oh look, we started Compass in October, and oh look, our transition, all of our transition and case management um, quality indicators like skyrocketing. So we were like, go team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Outstanding. So it can be done. It can be done. It can be done. And this is why, and we had Jane and Nore make a presentation for all of our home health and outpatient team leaders. We recorded that. It's on our website, so you'll be able to see that as well and share with your, um, once your home health and outpatient team leaders are identified, we'll have that to share. But um, Enrica can vouch for this. Tom's and Karen and, and, and Sarah, where's Sarah like in a shoot? There's Sarah back there. We would, when we would have our home health and outpatient um, <clears throat> engagement, little core group meetings, and Karen smiling, we would say, we know this can be done, we know this can be done. And Jane and Nore, would, she, they would just blaze the trail, and they would always make us smile and sometimes laugh out loud and keep our spirits up and keep us motivated because we knew it could be done. And once they did it, and take that checklist, that she passed out. Mm -hmm. Take that with you. We also have that posted on our website. We got permission for that. And they just do an outstanding job of communicating on behalf of their patients and caregivers. And we're so grateful. And let's give them a round of applause.